Okay, so while we wait for the rest of the people, let me just uh, briefly remind you of what I discussed last week. So last week we've essentially just uh, introduced the concept of a jet. And uh, so for the first part of the lecture, I essentially discussed about how, what's the topology of, the what's the distribution of final state particles in an event. And the easiest, uh, the easiest system to discuss in that context is E plus E minus going to, say, hadrons, uh, kind of collisions. And in this case, uh, what we learned was that typically, instead of having a uniform uniformish distribution of particles in the event, the particle seem tends to organize an, along a few uh, dominant directions. So the, the energy, the distribution of energy in the final state flows in very collimated, uh, a, a few handful of very collimated particle the directions, and this is essentially the idea of jets. So the idea being that uh, there's a hard process occurring at the core of the collision, and whenever there's a hard quark or gluon produced in that, in that process, this is then going to branch by uh, emitting collinear branchings, because we know that in QCD, collinear branchings are extremely frequent. And in this context, whenever you have collinear branching accompanied potentially with soft emissions anywhere, uh, most of the energy flows in the directions of the hard particles that were created at the beginning. And there's essentially two ways to quantify this. The first one is to use uh, observables which, which measure how pencil-like events are, like thrust that we discussed extensively uh, last week. And uh, the method which is probably more used uh, today, at least both in, in any kind of colliders, high-energy colliders, is to directly uh, find the method, a jet definition or a jet algorithm, that isolates and identifies these directions where there's lots, those directions in which you have lots of, lots of energy, all right? And so uh, this is valid both in E plus E minus and in PV collisions. I'm just going to remind you at the end of the day, I, at the end of, the, of last lectures, I listed a series of possible jet definitions of ways you would, you would define jets. And so the idea is that you find a method that goes from all the particles in your event, and it's a method that gives you the jets, and in a way, d these particles are, are whatever you observe in the final state, and these jets are essentially proxies to partons. You, you can view this as a well-defined uh, definition of partons, because partons are not well-defined in all order of QCD, while jets are supposed to be defined at any order of perversion theory in, in this context. And so this is the jet definition. And uh, in terms of the definitions we introduced last week, I, I'm just going to summarize a few definitions that I, well, just the main definition, definitions that I'll use in the, next, uh, in, the next, in the next series of lectures. The way to do this is to proceed by uh, iterative recombinations. So you take, a l you take along, among the list of particles you have, you define a distance, the ij, which is, so let me write it down, the minimum kt. So I, I'm, I'm going by default to use a proton proton type of collision. So I'm going to use transverse energies, uh, rapidity, and azimuth as the variables. Uh, most of this can be just ported back and forth between E plus and minus and PP collisions. So let me put a factor 2p here, kti, ktj, 2 to the 2p, times uh, delta r ij, which is square root, well, so there's no square root here, uh, delta y squared plus delta phi squared between particle i and j. Again, if you do this in E plus E minus collisions, this is going to be the minimum of the energy, and this is just going to be the angle, or 1 minus cosine of the angle between, between the two particles. Uh, and this is what I'll sometimes refer to as delta r squared ij. And so essentially what you do is, uh, what you do here is identify the minimum distance between all these sets of particles and recombine these two particles into one and you iterate. Uh, the idea is that you're going to stop. Uh, in E plus E minus there's a stopping condition which is slightly different, but you could actually use exactly the same as the one I'm going to use here. You define for each particle uh, a, what, what people refer to as the distance to the beam, 
uh, there's historical reasons for that that I don't want to go into. Times just some R square, which is just a parameter. And essentially what this tells you is that if you assume that these two numbers are these two prefactors, kinematic prefactors are essentially of the same order, uh, what this tells you is that the algorithm, whenever this distance is minimum, what this algorithm is going to do is say particle i is now a jet. So instead of just taking the minimum of this set of distances, you take the minimum of the whole set. This does a pairwise recombination. This calls an object a jet. And typically, this is going to happen when the distance here between the particles is bigger than r. And so typically, r here is a resolution parameter. There's an arbitrariness in defining jets as particles in a way, uh, saying, what do you call collinear? If I have two particles very nearby here, do I call them collinear, or so do they belong to the same jet or to two different jets? Okay? And essentially, what we're going to say is just swipe the details under the rug, saying, we're going to call these two jets or one jet, depending on the uh, free parameter that I'm free to choose. Okay? So in this context, and I'm probably going to use maybe all of them. There's the case of p equals either minus 1, 0, or 1. These are essentially the three main choices you can use. Uh, p equals 1 is the historical KT algorithm. Uh, this tends to be the KT of the particle. The name is no, is no uh, big surprise. Uh, p equals 0 is the Cambridge Atom algorithm, which is, in that case, this prefactor drops out. And this is a simple thing you can do. You just cluster particles going to the geometry, generally the geometry. And p equals minus 1 is the MTKT algorithm, which uh, weights distances according to the inverse of, the, of their energy. And this is the part that the, the algorithm that's used by default at the LHC for, uh, um, I would say, at least 90% of what they're doing. Yeah, maybe probably even 100%, because whenever they use something different than NTKT, they anyway start with NTKT. But anyway, in the, in the rest of the lecture, so starting from next week, I'm going to use all three of those. Uh, mostly uh, these two, and actually mostly this one. Uh, so that's why I wanted to... Uh, Will you justify why the NTKT is natural? The KT looks natural, but the NTKT... Uh, so, uh, the, the main, so the reason why, that was actually a question that was asked after the lectures uh, last week. The reason why people take NTKT in a broad context is that imagine you have, uh, I don't know, I draw events in one dimensions because it's easier. Imagine I have uh, a set with particles here, so one particle with sub guys, okay? Uh, what this guy, what, what KT is going to do is it puts actually a small weight to distance which have, uh, which have soft particles. So these particles are going to start clustering among themselves and at the end of the day they're going to cluster with a hard gun. And so at the end of the day what this does is making the edges of your jet a little bit uh, smeared uh, and in a way unstable to soft radiation. Imagine you add an underlying event, you add pilot, uh, the edges of your jets are going to change. And so this means that in terms of uh, reconstructing jets, in particular experimentally, uh, this gives you a harder time. While if you use the NTKT algorithm, you essentially uh, say that the distance between the hard guy and the guy nearby is going to be small. So what this algorithm is going to do is start merging the particles which are near the hard guy with the hard guy. So this one's going to be merged, this one's going to be merged, this one's going to be merged, this one's going to be merged until you reach a distance uh, r on each side. So if you think about this in two dimensions, what's going to happen is you're going to start growing like, like an onion, ray, onion from, deals, inside. Uh, from inside out until you reach r, and so the hard jets are circular. And if you add soft radiation, it won't change anything. So the, the, the advantage here is that this algorithm is extremely resilient to any form of soft radiation, and in the context of a proton-proton collision, or a heavy ion collision for that matters, uh, this is something which is much appreciated when you have to actually reconstruct jets and measure jets. So this is the main reason why. It's actually the reason why people earlier, like at the Tevatron, preferred the cone algorithm, which had the similar kind of, uh, of homology. Yeah, so in that context, it's something I didn't say last week, and this is, it, it dates back almost 30 years now. 
at some point in the early 90s, uh, people at the Tevatron gathered and said, okay, you have all this freedom of choice. There's, there's dozens of jet definitions you can write, which makes sense. Uh, is there a list of conditions we want uh, on, those, uh, on those jet definitions? And they essentially came with a list of five items which can be uh, sort of reorganized into three main ideas. The first one is that it needs to be, uh, as we just discussed, relatively resilient to the different views of an event. You can view it that way. This kind of thing, at the end of the day, you will apply this in a very broad range of cases. You will apply this to uh, very simple events, perturbative events, leading, leading next to leading next to next leading events, with three, four, five particles in the event. You will apply the same thing when you run this through Pythia and whatever event generator you might have, which adds on top of that all sorts of extra events. You can run this when you add hadronization, when you add underlying event, when you add detector simulations, or when you do a real detector. At the end of the day, if you look at all the ways of representing that same event, you hope that the jet that come out of this are relatively coherent and independent of how you view this event. So this is, uh, this is one of the conditions. It's quite subjective, but this is one of the conditions. The second one is that it needs to be OK from a theoretical point of view, which means it needs to be finite at any order of the perturbation theory. And that's essentially the condition of infrared and linear safety that we discussed at length last, last week. And the third condition is that it needs to be, uh, I would say, practical. And by practical here, I mean it needs to be fast enough. So imagine the LHC has to wait for uh, 10 minutes at each event to get the jets. Uh, that's not what I call practical. So luckily enough, all these guys have a fast implementation now. And so all these, so being fast enough, being practical in a, being finite in perturbation theory and being reasonably resilient against different ways of viewing a collision, all these guys do, uh, do satisfy these conditions. So there are, there are good jet definitions in that sense. Uh, and I think the reason why the AHC chose the MTKT at the end is mostly because it's the most resilient in terms of, in terms of this. And perturbatively speaking, it doesn't make a big difference. There are actually cases, I'll, I'll actually show you an example. I'm going to use this one today, and I'll sh show you how using something different uh, can cause extra pain. So, uh, every, does anyone have any question about what we did last week? question. When you are doing this, are you not favoring the case where you have a, a, where the partners are and they are um, close to having um, a both with a, a more or less on the center of mass? of mass, you understand? But that no, they're because uh, they're different. Uh, uh, th that's the idea of using, of using KT. Actually, essentially, if you boost your event longitudinally, it doesn't make a difference. So longitudinal boosts are, so if you look at, if you take, uh, I'm actually going to use it later, so if you look at the representation for, for a vector in these, in, these, uh, in these coordinates, so essentially, let me make it massless, there's kt times some, I'm, I'm going to use px, py, pz, and energies for a reason which is going to be obvious in a, in a second, P, kt, that, that's cos phi, so phi is the azimuth around the, uh, around the beam, there's a sin phi, we use the same notation for phi in both cases, hopefully, which is that's just a transverse coordinate. And then the longitudinal coordinates, there's this hyperbolic sign of rapidity and hyperbolic cosine of rapidity. I like to put the energy at the end because then the uh, separation between transverse and longitudinal is more, is more apparent. Uh, so if you do it that way and you boost, the only thing a boost is going to do is a longitudinal boost is just going to add some delta here and there. And so if you take, if you take repeated differences, then they are, they, are in, they are invariant. So this is actually why, uh, I mean, it, this is not only the case for, for jets. Uh, oh, by the way, there's actually a, a side note on this. Experimentalists tend to use not rapidity, but pseudo rapidity, which is defined as an angle. And this one doesn't have that property. So uh, at least not generally speaking. So this is sometimes you need to be a bit careful about what you're, you're doing. So. What I want to do today is a prepara mostly a preparation for, uh, for what we're going to do next. So I'm first going to do what I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do next. 
Next week, the idea is to dig into jet substructure and most of the concepts associated with it. Uh, then, what I'll have, I plan to do for the last set of two lectures is try to look closer at many of the substructure techniques and try to see whether it's, there's a way to understand how they work in terms of QCD. And so for this, what I'm going to do is going to be able to make on-order resummations in QCD, calculations to on-order in QCD. And this is also sort of connected, this is directly connected, not sort of, this is directly connected to things we did last week. If you remember when we computed thrust or uh, the three jet rate for, uh, for any of these guys in E plus E minus collisions, when you compute this at order alpha s, you see alpha s coming not necessarily alone and finite, but if alpha s coming with logarithms of whatever resolution parameter you might have. So alpha s times log of one minus thrust, or alpha s times log of the cut you have in, in defining jets. Or in this case, you might have alpha s logs of the jet radius, for example. So whenever you have, since QCD has soft and collinear divergences, so uh, the probability for emitting particles at small angles or at small energy goes like d energy over energy or d theta over theta. These, this is directly related to infrared and linear safety in the sense that your observable need to be finite. But as a leftover from this finiteness, you may have logs of whichever ratio. When you have two different scales, uh, you expect logs of the ratios of these two scales. Or when you have two different angular resolution parameters, you expect log of these resolution parameters. And this is something you definitely have to keep in mind. Whenever you have different scales in QCD, you should expect logs of any ratios you can build of these, of these, uh, of these scales, either angular or energy scales. So this is something I'm going to have to uh, discuss at length, uh, use at length at least in, the, in lectures four and five. Uh, and so I'm going to do today an introduction to what, how you do this. Uh, so, the idea is that if alpha s times the, even if alpha s is small, if the log is large, then alpha s times the log becomes of order 1, and so you need to resum to include this alpha s times log to all orders alpha s to any power in QCD. Alright? So, when there's, uh, as I told you, there's two reasons I want this. The first reason is, first, I, I find it interesting per se. It's actually a big topic in QCD to be able to do resummations to all orders. Two, I'm going to need it, and uh, more actually it's two, it's probably more important. I'm going to need this for lecture four and five, so I might as well get rid of it now. Uh, there's also, so that's for my part. For your part, there's also two ways of viewing this lecture. Uh, one is, uh, I would say, the simple pedestrian way, which is for all the physics discussion at the end, that's all I need, which is just a quote unquote simple, and you'll see simple may not be that simple. Uh, the symbol leading logarithm, so I'm only, for all I need at the end of the lecture is I'm only going to need the leading terms in this resummation. And that's fairly easy. Uh, to make the lecture maybe a little bit more interesting or appealing, I'm going to try and uh, show you what it would take to go to higher precision in the resummation, but uh, this won't be needed for the rest. So if at some point this feels too, uh, too complicated for you, just either let me know or it doesn't matter anyway. If, if it, I want you at the end of the day to go home with a feeling that you understand leading log, uh, the rest is for either in your own interest or QCD effects in adults. All right? So I'm going to take one example. And the example I'm going to take is based again on things I'm going to do in the future. And so the example I'm going to do is take the mass of a jet. So imagine you have a jet with a high PT. So I shoot a jet with, uh, let me start with a single part, okay? And a given resolution size. So I'm looking in a radius R around this jet. And this jet is, of course, going to radiate. There's all sorts of quarks, partons, uh, quarks and gluons, then hadrons in that jet. And at the end of the day, uh, by radiating, this jet will acquire a virtuality, and so it will acquire a mass. All right? So the k squared, the p square of this jet is non zero. And so the question is can you compute in QCD the distribution of the mass of a jet? All right? A uh, very typical uh, use case for this, uh, 
actually not necessarily that practical, but imagine you want to measure W bosons decaying to QQ bar, or if you want to measure top quarks decaying to quarks, at some point, uh, if you try to look at, you, you may imagine the top quark, that's easier. If you want to try to measure a top decaying to hadrons, you may just look at the mass of the jet and look if the mass of the jet is compatible with the mass of the top. All right, that's, uh, that's a simple use case. Now the question is, what's the background from this coming from just simple quarks, light quarks, going into a jet with the same mass, all right? So this is a simple case. You may want to measure the mass of a jet because it's a background to, uh, to top measurements, all right? So uh, we're going to do simple first and say, I'm just going to have one glue animated here. I'm trying to follow my notes reasonably. Uh, and yeah, let's start with just the quark with one glue on, all right? And so uh, I, I'm going to do this mostly in the context of PP collisions. Uh, for most of it, it's, it's the same PP collisions or in E plus E minus. Uh, just do the same thing instead of making some radius r in the cylinder around the beam in a PP collision, make a, a circle of radius r in the, uh, in the sphere in the E plus E minus collision. So it doesn't, it doesn't make a big difference. So if you want this, the question is what's the mass of that jet, okay? If this particle is within the jet, the mass of the jet is P1. Uh, do I need some notation here? Uh, yeah, say P1 here. Uh, how do we do this? Uh, yeah, let me put P1. Uh, I may change this in the future. It doesn't. Sometimes I usually denote by K the. Uh, let me put K1 and K2. That's easier. I usually do Ks for the uh, for the outgoing one. So the mass of the jet is K1 plus K2 squared, right? And so uh, again, I'm, I'm assuming uh, massless particles. And so this is. Uh, if you do this in E plus E minus, it's going to be 2 times the energy of 1 times the energy of 2 times 1 minus cosine theta 1, 2. Uh, and I'm going to say that these, so this has a fraction 1 minus z of the total energy. This has a fraction z of the total energy. And so at the end of the day, this is 2 z 1 minus z times 1 minus cos theta 1, 2. And for the sake of the argument, at the moment, I'm... I'm e squared, right? Uh, there's an e squared, thanks. Uh, so what I'm going to do is, for the moment, I'm actually going all through the lectures at various points, I'm going to make simplifying assumptions. Whenever I'm going to make simplifying assumptions, I keep that somewhere in, the, in some corner of your mind. I'm going to come back and justify it later, all right? So I'm going to assume the angle is small. Or if you wish, make r small. Take the limit of a small radius. In this case, 1 minus cos is just theta squared. This is z, 1 minus z, theta 1, 2 squared, all right? No big, no biggie. Uh, if you do this in, th this would be for an E plus E minus context. If you do this in a PP collision context, you get your M squared, which is PT squared times Z1 minus Z. And again, theta 1, 2 would be delta R1, 2 squared. So that's, uh, that's actually easy. I if you don't make this assumption, you have to treat the 1 minus cos, which is not exactly the same as this, but that's, uh, uh, I'm going to come back later to this. All right, so what happens if you want to compute the mass distribution in this case? If you want to compute the mass distribution, let me do this here so I can keep the, uh, the upper blackboard for more serious stuff. Uh, if you want to compute the mass of the jet, again, I'm trying to stay at least close to the notations I have here. If you want to compute the mass of the jet here, uh, yeah, I won't need this now. You're going to have 1 over sigma, this sigma dm squared. So at first order, generally speaking, at first order in perturbation theory, you have to integrate over all possible three-body phase space in the final state. Uh, the cross-section, uh, one or normalized cross-section, uh, d phi 3. All right, that's just, uh, globally speaking, I'm integrating the total cross-section, and the cross-section for any three-particle final state in this the case, times delta of m squared, minus z, one minus z, 
pt squared times uh, delta r squared. Uh, there's an extra condition which, which I mean, you're going to say I have three particles in the final state, which delta r do I take? Uh, let me wave this in the rug and say you need some form of a theta function that I'm going to say a theta injet. Uh, well, I don't know. If you do either, you do e plus e minus collisions. In which case, you have e plus e minus going to uh, going to three particles, and this can be either e plus e minus or quark any quark or quark gluon or whatever two incoming particles. So. Yeah, if you wish the lowest possible order of the perturbation theory, which would be alpha s to the zero yeah, in plus e minus alpha s square in pp going to dijet, or alpha s if you I don't know if you take z plus j for example, the lowest order at which this is non-zero would be uh, would be two particles in the jet, and so you need three particles in the final state to have some some particle that balances it. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you take so. In principle, this is a complicated set of theta functions, right? If you have, I don't know, if you have a thousand particles in your, in your event, you can still write down the, the effect of the jet algorithm as a series of theta functions. Uh, they're going to be quite complicated at some point. Uh, so let me assume I'm looking, I don't know, take a region of the phase space somewhere and assume you have a particle here. Then typically what this means for two particles, it means that delta r squared has to be smaller than r squared, or that r is more than r. Two variables are within the genus. Yeah. Okay. So globally speaking, this is not so easy. All right. This is the, the full matrix element. I don't know. Make it digets in QCD. Already, the next leading order matrix elements are not that trivial. Uh, and ask for friends in the audience for next next leading order. Uh, so that's where this assumption comes in. If I assume that I work with small, small enough radius, again, I'm going to uh, discuss the implications of this later. If I assume that the radius is small enough, we've learned last week that in the, in the collinear limit, the emission of a collinear gluon like this actually just factorizes from the rest of the event. Okay. So in this context, this is just going to be a born level integration that simplifies essentially against the uh, against the normalization times just the emission of a, a, a one blue one here. So in this context, in the context where uh, where I'm assuming the radius is small, where this collinear emission factorizes from the rest, this simply becomes an integration d theta squared over theta squared, an integration dz some splitting function of z times alpha s over 2 pi. So this, remember, this is one of the things we discussed, uh, we discussed last week. Uh, is there anything else I need? So this integration goes from 0 to r squared. Remember, that particle needs to be within the z. And I just have delta of m squared minus z, 1 minus z, uh, p squared. And delta r squared in this case is d squared. OK? Essentially, that's, that's one of the. Uh, that factorizes from the hard process, right? From yeah, that factorizes from the hard process. And since I'm taking a normalized distribution, the, that hard process cancels out. <coughs> so th that's one of the very sim the, the huge simplifications when you work in the collinear limit is that you don't need to you don't need the full matrix elements. Uh, I'll, I'll come back to that uh, to that later, probably not not quite soon um, after the break, definitely. Uh, so. I guess this. I guess everyone can compute this. Can ever even compute this exactly, right? Uh, that's not my goal. First, uh, you can trivially do the theta integration. If you do the theta integration, uh, you have just to make sure, and, and that's one common mistake. When I, I, mean, I, I remember at the beginning, I was doing these calculations. That's something I, I always, oh, no, not always, half of the time, I easy, you easily fail to remember that. Uh, there's a boundary on theta integra under theta integrations. So you need to remember that uh, the condition on theta is not always necessarily simplified, always 
not always satisfied. And so for this, that's going to give you theta squared, which is m squared over z1 minus z pt squared, all right? And you need this to be smaller than r squared. And if you need this to be smaller than r squared, it actually gives you a condition on, uh, a condition on z. And the condition on z is, if you do it in its full glory, the condition on z is uh, 1 minus, uh, let me put it this way, 1 minus 4 over 2, so on, and z smaller than 1 plus. And rho is, I'll put that somewhere here, because that's rho is m squared over p d squared r squared. I remember this one because this is essentially this is the only uh, dimension. This is the the main dimensionless quantity you can build out of this out of these numbers. Uh, okay. So again. Yeah. P of z is a polynomial uh, modulo the soft divergence. So P of z is a term which is one, one, 1 over z, coming from the emission of soft gluons. And the rest is a finite polynomial. Uh, besides this, this is just an integration over a finite range of a polynomial. So this is something, in principle, everyone can do. Okay? Uh, so remember, I want to focus on the case where we have large locks. And the case where we have large logs that I'm going to focus on is m squared much smaller than pd squared, or in other terms, rho much smaller than 1. So this is generally the limit I want to consider. I don't care about the rest so far. All I want to do here, well, I don't care. I don't care in the context of this lecture, all right? So since uh, l is small, you really have to impose m squared by 1 and pd squared r squared. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's pd squared r squared in this context, yeah. Okay, so uh, this means that actually I'm taking the limit where rho is small. And so this brings some simplifications. Because if you want to take this expression here, I actually won't have enough space here. Uh, if you take this expression here, oh, let me carry on. By. You have 1 over sigma this sigma dm squared, which is the integration between one. So this thing here is typically rho, all right? So it's rho plus something of order rho squared. And this thing here is 1 minus all of rho. dz, p of z, alpha s over 2 pi, and uh, from the delta function here, you get a 1 over m squared. OK? Can you simplify this further? Keep in mind, what I want to do at the end is we know that in this limit, what well, we expect, at least in this limit, we expect some logs. All right? The question is, where are the logs in this expression? Uh, you know here that p of z is cf, let me take a case of a quark, okay? Is cf times 1 plus 1 minus z squared over z. And rho is small. So this expression in this context is going to be this is 2 cf over, z, well, times, and you write it down this way. This is 2 cf times 1 over z plus finite. OK? So at the end of the day, this integration here, if you take the 1 over z part, you're going to get a log 1 over rho plus corrections which are of order rho. So this term gives you a 1 over m squared alpha s cf over pi times this term here gives you a log 1 over rho plus corrections of all the rho. And the finite term here gives you plus finite, again, plus all the rho. OK? 
okay? And so step number one, when you, do, uh, when you want to do an order of calculation, you're only interested in logs. And the precision of your resummation dictates which logs you're interested in or not. So uh, approximation, the simplest approximation you can do is say the leading logarithm approximation, where you're interested in the most number, the biggest, largest number of logs, and so that means in this case you just retain this term here and drop all the rest. If you want the next leading log approximation, you need to take one more, uh, one log down in the food chain, and so you need to take as well the finite term as well. Okay? In any case, this term can be dropped. These have no logs, so there's no, th these are generally powers of rho. So if you say I'm going to count logs of rho, any power is anyway going to go to zero at some point. So this, these terms are called power corrections, as their name uh, uh, suggests. And uh, those can always be neglected. And so if you roll back, actually this is simplification. It means that already from the beginning, I could have just dropped the one minus z here. Because the one minus z there is what creates these extra terms in integration. If you just drop the one minus z here, it means that this condition just becomes rho smaller than z smaller than one, and you're done with it. And so this is whenever, uh, whenever you're interested in logs, uh, you can or one thing you should do is when you compute your observables, in this case the mass, you should compute the mass in the limit where the emissions are soft and greener. And actually, this is true. This is valid up to. Uh, this is still valid at next leading log as well. Uh, it, 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 it'd be strange that the uh, final z corrections matter for the splitting function. You cannot go behind leading log, but they never matter for the for the phase space. Uh, it's because for the splitting function they give you something finite. For the phase space they give you something something like a power. Uh, essentially, it's a correction from one. While this one is a genuine. Well, well I don't know. Uh, yeah, that's. So, well, th these corrections would come in somehow at next to next log, one way or another. There, there's actually a different correction, not exactly the ones that, uh, there's different terms in which you would bring a correction at next to next. Uh, but not from, it's not visible from this simple, uh, from this simple calculation. So, this would be the leading log, this would be the next to leading log, and the rest is power corrections. Uh, so it's, it's actually not very, uh, instead of considering this, it's actually easier, instead of computing the differential distribution, to compute the cumulative distribution. Uh, So the quantity actually that most people consider in this case is not the differential distribution, but the cumulative distribution, which is essentially the probability that your mass is smaller than something. All right? So uh, if you stick this one in, this is going to be the integration between 0 and m squared, the m bar squared over m bar squared alpha cf over 2 pi log 1 over rho. A and the finite term, in this case, this finite term is often called b. Uh, it, it, this term everyone can compute, right? It's just the integration between 0 and 1 of the finite piece of the, of the finite, uh, finite terms in the splitting function. So it's minus 3 quarters for, uh, for, uh, for quarks. And actually, if you go back to the expressions I gave last week for thrusts and the Y3 jet rate, this term is, is the exact coefficient of the single log in the one I gave. Now let me call it B, in this case BQ for a quark, and uh, you can actually write down, rescale everything by PT squared R squared, and in that case it would be, into, it would be a row everywhere, right? So let me do row in case, uh, so that's, that's a bit easy, I can get rid of the mass everywhere. How does that work? I know that all. 
I mean, it's d rho over rho times, uh, well, there's no square here. d rho over rho times integrated to zero, you're in trouble here. What am I missing? Alpha is here. Ah, uh, that's something we've discussed at length last week as well. I mean, the no, this is soft. I mean, the, the, the log here comes from the integration dz over z. So this log here is soft. Yeah, yeah, we'll allow the mass to be zero, but there's no, the making a cutoff is not going to help you. I mean, come on. At the end of the day, you want a finite result. QCD, perturbative QCD gives you finite results at any order of the perturbation theory, provided you include both. What? Real and virtuals. So this is only the real terms. At, at the end of the day, I'm going to have a virtual term where I don't know a loop somewhere here, where there's only one particle in the jet, and this in this case, m squared is zero. And so if I integrate to zero, this should be included, all right? Uh, the same thing, if you just make one single particle at the lowest order of the perturbation theory, this is delta of, uh, this is delta of uh, one minus rho. And so in this context, there should be a term here, which is one, integration from zero to one and delta of one minus something is just one, and then plus this contribution, and you'll have the virtual contribution as well. Now, let me see exactly, because I think this is correlates with what I'm saying, uh, I'm going to say later. Now, the virtual correction, uh, this is actually another thing to take home, is that we know that at the end of the day, real and virtual need to cancel. Okay, in the limit where rho goes to zero, real and virtual need to cancel. So you definitely know the structure of the virtual correction as well. This is just exactly the same structure as this one, right? So the virtual correction is going to give you minus the integration. Now, the upper bound of the integration for the virtual is not, is not rho because there's no constraint of this emission, okay? So you need the integration to be uh, alpha is <coughs> CF over 2 pi times log one for one. Well, you can write this down differently if you want. You can just say, th in this case, I'm going to write this as, say, let me put the one from the, uh, from the leading term here, the integration where it's real, plus the integration uh, plus here, and then there's a, let me factor out the, the, the term for the fact that the virtual term is negative, d sigma over dm squared virtual. In a way, I don't know, this, this is not extremely precise, but you can view the emission of this blue one here if you write it down this way. You can, you can always write a phase space for this also using these uh, theta and z, uh, theta and z variables. And you see that the constraint that this is bounded by rho is just that my mass is bounded by rho, all right? So this is what's coming, uh, the upper bound here. Now, if this integration here is, uh, the mass is always zero, so I actually should integrate with the whole phase space, which is uh, where, in, which in this case, the integration here goes all the way to m squared equals pd squared r squared, which means rho equals one. All right? Is this finite? Sure. I mean, now these are exactly the same thing. So this is one minus the integration between rho and one d rho bar over rho bar alpha and c f. Or sad. There's a factor of two. Yeah, no, there's no factor of two. And this now becomes an integration everyone can do. It's alpha s c f over pi times one half log square one over rho my plus b okay the, the fact that the maximum value of rho is exactly one is that up to corrections it's a number of all one and so that goes beyond I mean, in this case, it has to be one because it, you, you, things need to cancel in the limit. Where, well, you know, if rho goes to pd squared r squared, this goes to zero. Oh, sorry, this goes to one. The end of your spectrum in, in this soft and linear limit, your spectrum ends up when rho is of order uh, when rho is of order one, and so in, when rho is of order one, these two cancel, and so the cumulative distribution goes to one. Uh, 
uh, there's corrections when rho becomes finite, and, but when rho becomes finite, uh, you can essentially throw all this out because I'm, I'm, by five it means more than one. Yeah, I'm essentially by, by assuming rho is much more than one. So I mean, the reason why is there any reason why at least I'm asking you why do you think people tend to prefer with to work with this expression rather than this one? So there's two reasons. One you will discover in the future, or right after. The other one is, uh, is the following. Wh why do you expect logs in the calculations like this? Why should the, what's the physical origin of these logs? Soft and linear, OK? So if something is soft, you expect one log. If something is linear, you expect a log as well. So this log square here, there's one log coming from soft, typically one log coming from the integration of over z. And then the integration, once you've done the integration over z, the integration of a row or the integration over the angle is the same. And so in this case, there's, you get two logs, because you get one log coming from soft and one log coming from collinear. Now if you look here, this term here, this is the finite part of the splitting. So this is something where the emission is not soft. But you're still integrating over this frame here, which is which is actually probing the collinear region, and so this log here is is collinear, but not uh, yeah hard and collinear, okay. And in this uh, in this sense, I think this is slightly easier to see in this case because you just look at the power of the logs. Well, in this case, you have to essentially do a plus one, all right. Mm -hmm. uh, so for these reasons. Uh, so the logic is that at the end of the day, at the end of this lecture, I want to be able to imagine that log is that, that rho is small. If rho is small, this log is large, and so alpha s times log square can be over the one. If alpha s times log square is over the one, uh, this needs to be resumed to all orders in position theory. Now, if alpha s log is over the one, not only this has to be resumed, but this has to be resumed as well. All right. And so this is the leading log as the one here, which is in this case a double log. And this is the next leading log, which is in this case a single log. All right? So let me see if I'm, let me check if I'm forgetting something here. Um, in the context of the graph, the standard, um, the moment graph like is double log and single log. What we just said. Yeah. Okay. So there's. Uh, I'm, I'm going to cover the data and the FK a little later if I have time. Uh, it is the same in a way. D -glad, the Dglab equation tends to resum. There's a big difference between what we're doing here in Dglab and the FKL, which is that well, there's at least one conceptual difference which is we're actually doing the calculation in the final state. What DGLAB does is resuming PDFs, which is the initial state. DFKL does something similar. But you see the same thing. If you do the DGLAB equation, which is collinear in the initial state, you essentially have this, this structure, which includes both the soft and the finite collinear. And if you do the FKL, you include both the collinear and the soft but non-collinear part. Uh, so it's the, it's the same thing. Uh, you can actually obtain the same result. Oh, no, not quite the same result. You can do, you remember last week, I told you if you take e plus e minus if you are gluons, there are two interesting limits. One is taking the collinear limit, in which, take, in which case you get this factorization. The other one is taking the soft limit, in which case you get the antenna formula. You can just assume I'm going to have soft emissions, in which case you have the antenna formula, and at least you'll get the double log, and you potentially get a single log for emissions which are soft and large angles. I, if I have time and I'm starting to doubt about this, uh, I can sketch you one of these calculations. Um, but it's the same spirit. At least the double log is going to be, uh, well, the, lo the double log is going to be the same. And actually, in, for this observable here, uh, the, uh, the soft and large angle is actually, in, in, well, in this limit, it's zero. But OK. All right. So unless an, if, if someone has a question, about this, ask now. Otherwise, be ready to make your first or another all order calculation. All right? So we're going all orders.
Why do I want to go orders? And again, this is a, long, a lengthy calculation, so let me just uh, let me just try and keep the notation fine. So I'm going to have a sum. No, what I'm going to have is a series of emissions, not just one. I have a number of emissions. Okay. What logs if you have n emissions? So I'm working at half phase to the n. What logs do you expect in that context? So we, you'll have terms which are log 1 over rho to some power here. What's the largest power you can expect there? 2 n, because in that, would happen, that would happen when each single emission is at the same time soft and collinear. And that would be the leading log, or double log if you want. Then you have term alpha s to the n log to the 2n minus 1. Uh, and then the naming depends on how you count. But that's at least part of the next leading log. Uh, there's, there's a subtlety here I'd like to avoid mentioning if we, uh, unless we get there at the end of the day. OK? So the first thing, that the strategy is going to be exactly the same as what we did at first order. The first idea is just try to compute the observable. What's the value of the jet mass if you have a set of emissions like this? Then uh, do the integration in the soft and collinear limits, or at least in the collinear limit, because I'm still going to roll with r smaller than 1, for any number of emissions, and try to isolate where these logs are coming from. So first thing, what's the mass? So let me assume I do have here, uh, so anyway I can do this. Let me say this is particle 0, and then I have emissions 1 to n. That's probably the easiest one. <coughs> so you get m squared, which is the sum over i, ki, <coughs> squared. All right, that's the mass is the invariant mass squared. That's uh, Einstein more than 100 years ago. Now, particles are massless, so this is just 2 times the sum over i smaller than j, ki dot kj. Good. Uh, let me do this in e minus collisions because it's a bit. Uh, is there a, yeah, let me do this in e minus collisions because it's a little bit simpler to see the structure. Uh, so that's going to be 2. Uh, yeah, that's going to be a sub. Yeah, and these particles need to be within the jet, okay? That's the i within the jet. So that's going to be the sum over i smaller than j, ei, ej, times theta ij squared. Uh, that's the same thing, exactly the same calculation we did earlier, all right? Now, theta ij squared is theta i squared. So there's actually two ways to measure the angles, all right? So if you have, if you have your jet, with that would be the jet axis, and you have a series of particles in your jet, I'm going to define theta i j as distance between these two particles, which are the angles here, and then you can define a theta i, which is the distance to the jet axis. And then you can just write theta i j squared as theta i squared plus theta j squared minus 2 theta i theta j times some cosine of some azimuth angle. I don't know if you take these two, that would be the, the azimuth angle here. Okay, and so if you do that, this is th there's two sums coming from this where you can just reorder the i and j. This is one half the sum of i different from j. That's just no counting. So this is going to be this sum is going to contribute one. This sum is going to contribute another time, and so this is going to be the sum for i within the jet times e i. What is the sum for j within the jet of ej uh, theta j squared? That's going to be these two terms here. Minus, I'm going to be crammed a little bit here. Uh, go down a little bit. Minus the sum over i and over i the ei theta i times the sum over j ej theta j cos ij. Okay? Can you simplify this?
What's this? So I, the K key? No, I'm essentially taking the sum of all particles of their K T times the cos of an angle. It, it would be K T. This is this is the K T, but then it's K T times the cos. So essentially, what I'm doing is taking the transverse momentum of each of these particles, projecting it into one axis. What's that sum? Sum is zero. There's momentum conservation, right? The J is defined as the sum of all these particles. So if you try to project the momentum of, uh, along any given direction and sum that, you're going to get zero. So this is zero the momentum conservation. So at the end of the day, your mass, this is zero. This is the energy of your jet. So what you get is you factor out an energy here. This is E squared times the sum over I within Z, or J within Z in the equivalent notation, of Zj theta J squared. This is tiny bit more complicated if you, well, oof. no, it's actually exactly the same thing if you do it in PT collisions, you're just going to have delta R and in PT here. Uh, it's just that, yeah, the, the, uh, the cosine sometimes is a little bit less, uh, Less obvious. This, in a way, this is a huge simplification, right? It just tells you that if you have a list of emissions, I'm just going to have to sum them all. And so the contribute. This is just a sum of the individual contribution of each particles. Uh, I'll, I'll come back to that in in some time. Could, could one of the particles be emitted by another one, or they're all just leading particle emissions, leading particle emissions? You're reading my mind. Uh, so, from now on, I'm first going to assume QED. Uh, I'm going to this. So, for all these assumptions, I told you, I, if you wish, you can write them down somewhere. Uh, so, what are the assumptions we've done so far? We've done R squared much more than one, and we've done QED. We'll come back to that at some point. If I don't have enough time, at least I'll comment on what they, uh, on what they mean. Uh, actually, let me just, uh, let me just I, I need, so now, now comes the big calculation. Uh, maybe it's time to, yeah, maybe it's a good time to make a break. And the next bit is genuinely trying to get the old order equivalent of this. Okay? So maybe now is a good time to make a break. Uh, what, 10 minutes, something like that? Yeah. And then we, and then we reconvene in 10 minutes. Now is a good time to make a break. the first part of this. Of this kind. So we uh, I've put you the uh, the expression for the mass that you've just derived. I need to switch this off. Yeah. So there's the expression for the mass that we just derived, and there's the limit. Uh, and I remind you the result for uh, for the first order expansion. There was a typo in what I wrote earlier, right? Just for this part, it's actually one minus uh, in, in this context. Okay. So now I'm going to take QED. Why do I want to take QED first? Uh, because then I'm just having an electron or a quarky electron emitting uh, blue new photons. And I don't need to worry for the moment about whatever happens to this guy because I just assume I have just one thing shooting photons or photonine gluons or gluonine photons. Uh, put it wherever you want. Okay? So this means now I have a quark emitting a bunch of, a bunch of gluons. Now, I'm going to work in the, uh, in the collinear limit again. Uh, that's one of my assumptions there. And if you do this, you need to know exactly what's the matrix element to emit a bunch of, a bunch of, uh, a bunch of gluons, OK? Or a bunch of photons in this case. That would actually hold exactly for QED as well. Uh, now, in this context, what you can show, and that's not hard to understand, remember what I want at the end of the day is keep in mind, your tar the target you should keep in mind is double log. So I'm resuming all the terms of alpha s to the n log to the 2n. And that means every single one of my emission is not only collinear, it's also soft. OK? And this means in the soft and current emission, that I can just imagine you have a bunch of emissions here. So just, let me just take two emissions for that matter. I think of theta 1 and theta 2, this has a fraction, so you start with a fraction 1, this is going to split into 1 minus z1 and z1 here, this is going to further split into 1 minus z1 times 1 minus z2 and 1 minus z1 times z2, and so on and so forth, 
If I'm assuming that my animations are not only soft, but they're soft and linear, I can just drop, replace this by one, drop this factor, and just replace all this by one as well. Okay? So this means that if you do this, uh, traces of the 1 minus z factors are not present anywhere, and I can just assume that all the emissions just have some angle theta 1 and some fraction, some angle theta and some z fraction. Okay? So if I drop all these, say, momentum longitudinal or momentum conservation factors, which I can do in the limit where things are soft, then all my emissions are just completely independent. It's just a bunch of emissions. Each of them, if I reorder them, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter. Modular symmetry. So if I do this, I can just integrate d theta 1 over theta 1, dz1 over z1, let me take the soft limit, d theta 2 over theta 2, dz2 over z2, and then either I'm assuming angular ordering like you would normally do in an angular cascade like that. Every angle is smaller than the previous one. That's uh, proven since the 70s, or instead, so either I'm writing down the integration between 0 and r, and this integration between 0 and theta 1, or I'm just assuming these, both, these integrations are both up to, up to r, and I'm putting a symmetric factor in front, okay? Uh, in terms of generalizing to all orders, actually this one is simpler, and it means that if you want any number of emissions, so n emissions from, uh, uh, hold on a second. Uh, I realize I keep forgetting to give you references uh, and lecture notes and places where you can find information for this. Remind me at the end of the lecture to give you uh, where you can find material. Uh, so if you want n emissions, you just get a sum. At the end of the day, if you want sigma of m squared, the first thing you're going to do is have a sum over any number of emissions you can have from 0 to infinity. Each of them will have a phase space which is 1 over n factorial, the integration d theta squared what the product over i d theta i squared over theta i squared d z i let me keep p of z i here alpha s there's a question of the argument of alpha s I'll come back to it at some point over 2 pi so that's essentially the phase space all right this is the phase space I want to emit N emissions of N soft and greener emissions. Mm -hmm. All right? Now, in principle, what I want is a theta. I want sigma of m squared, so I want the jet mass to be smaller than m squared. And so if you do this theta m smaller than m squared, this is just going to be the first line there. This is going to be m squared, sorry, pd squared times the sum of z i theta i squared has to be smaller than m squared. And the same way you, uh, the same way this failed for at order alpha s, this is again going to fail, right? You're integrating this uh, for values smaller than m squared, so you're definitely exposing the limit where both z and theta go to zero, and yeah, that the previous one was diverging, this one diverges even badlier. <laughs> so what's missing here is, as previously, you need virtual corrections, all right? And in principle, so yeah, there's, there's something else here that I didn't constrain. In principle, this goes to any angle. You want here, this is the sum over particle i belonging to the jet. You only count the particles that are within, within the jet. If particles are outside the jet, they don't count to the mass, okay? So now, uh, there's essentially two ways to, uh, well, th there are several ways to introduce virtual corrections in an expression like this. And I'm not sure exactly which one is the best. One, uh, one thing you can do is just, so in principle it means that on top of any number of emissions here, I would in principle need to sum over all emissions, either real or virtual. So I'm going to say here, I'm summing over all emissions. And these emissions can be either real or virtual. And if they're real or virtual, the sum here remains with the sum of particles within the, within the jet, real emissions within the jet. And then you're essentially going to get a minus 1 to the power of the number of virtual emissions. All right, each emission comes with a minus 1. OK? Now, wh what you can do, if you wish, 
is just separate this into two, into two bits and pieces. You can just say, I'm going to have a sum over n from 0 to infinity or n factorial, where here the sum is just over real emissions, the integration product over i d theta i over theta i squared, d z i p of z i, alpha s over 2 pi, times theta of sum over i within jet, i theta i squared smaller than m squared, okay? And then times the sum over m from 0 to infinity, uh, product over i, blah, 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 1 over n factorial, minus 1 to the n over n factorial, the integration, the product, the same, exactly the same construct, okay? Without the theta. You write it nicely, product over i, d theta i squared or theta i squared d z i p of z i alpha s over 2 pi times i. Okay? So you have an arbitrary number of real emissions times an arbitrary, arbitrary number of real emissions and arbitrary number of original emissions. Now, obviously, this is not, is this finite? Uh, sort of, right? because you see that if you take the limit where z and theta goes to zero, you'll get a one here and a minus one here, and so the one and minus one cancel each other. Now, there's different ways to treat this. Typically, one way, which is actually very helpful when you, when you start doing all sorts of systematic resonations, is going to say, I'm going to put an epsilon cutoff on whatever variable here, put an epsilon cutoff here, and then take the limit epsilon going to zero. And in this case, this becomes easy, right? This integration here becomes finite. You get a log square of epsilon. And this is absolutely a bunch of independent things. They're all independent, so this is just an exponential, OK? And you can then put out the exponential, and the exponential is expected to regulate, is going to regulate the behavior. So this exponential of minus log square, alpha s log square of epsilon, and it obviously regulates the limit epsilon going to 0 here. Uh, so this is one subtlety. The second subtlety is this one. I need to sum particles within the jet and only within the jet. So one thing you can do, and I, I won't do it explicitly because that's going to grow like a dinosaur, uh, is to, you, you can split the emissions at what are the emissions within the jet and what are the emissions outside the jet. So again, and I'm partially going to put this on my list of things to come back to. Uh, I'm going to use the NTK <coughs> algorithm for which this is exact. Uh, if all the emissions are soft and collinear with respect to one another, uh, a particle is just going to be within the jet if its angle theta is smaller than the jet radius. And this is actually exact. If you have a soft emission, remember NTK builds like a perfect circle when you have soft emissions. So this is exact for NTK. Uh, it's not exact for Cambridge and KD, but at least it's exact in the limit where everything is soft and collinear. So let me just. Uh, Theta in jet uh, Let me put it there as the list of things I need to come back to. Okay? So again, you can split this as a list of particles within the jet and a list of particles outside the jet. Particles outside the jet do not contribute at all. All right, they don't contribute. So you can essentially split this sum into a list of particles within and outside. You can split this sum into a list of particles where theta is either smaller or bigger than r. Everything which is outside the jets doesn't contribute here. So it's a 1 here. Does contribute, doesn't contribute here except with a minus 1. So all particles outside the jet cancel between the real and virtual corrections. Okay? And if you think about it physically, it's OK. I'm just looking at the jet within a small angle somewhere here. And if I have an emission somewhere outside in the event, a soft and collinear, a soft and say collinear emission uh, in this context, even a soft emission sufficient, uh, the physics of what's happening down here at small angle doesn't care about the physics at large angles in this, the soft physics, what happens outside. So in this case, uh, real and virtual are indeed expected to cancel, and you do get something which is, uh, which is uh, well, you can neglect emissions outside the jet. Let me nonetheless put put it there because there's an extra comment I need to do on this. So I'm assuming that emissions outside the jet, I'm, at the moment I'm assuming they cancel, and you can understand why at leading log they do, because essentially physics is local 
and so collinear physics is local. It's the same reason why you can factor this from that. Something here has a weight for this and a weight for that, and the weight for outside is just canceling. I don't understand why don't we impose theta more than r a priori because sigma is a mass of the jet, so obviously all the theta should. No, no. Be In principle, here I'm summing over all emissions. So this expression, whatever I put as an observable here, you can always write it down as a sum over real emissions with some constraint on the real emissions times the sum over virtual emissions. So that's that's generic. Now it turns out that in the observable, the observable is the mass of a jet, and so the observable is only going to measure or be sensitive to emissions within the jet. All emissions outside, they're still there. They're still included in this expression. No, we've just got rid of them. But if you change the error... You if you change R, you're going to include more. But I mean, the Morgan fixed R at the moment. If you want to make it, I don't know, you can probably write down the differential equation as a function of R. It's doable, but that's not the only point. Essentially, what I'm saying here is that the emission outside the jet is the emission within the jet. And this is, a, again, a generic consideration. I mean, what I mean here is that if you make any observable here, say V, you have in this theta function the fact that the observable calculated on Z1 theta 1, Zn theta n, has to be smaller than uh, whatever observable you put in sigma V here. OK? Uh, but that should be associated uh, with the jet, so all the details should be smaller than the air, because otherwise they are not be known to the jet. Yeah. So in a way, you don't, don't have to think about what happens outside the jet, because the details are inside the jet. I agree, I agree, but uh, in, in a way I've just proven that in a way. Saying that all emissions outside the jet, there's a real contribution which cancels again the equivalent vertical contribution. I'll come back to that in a second. Well, in a second. Uh, hopefully I'll come back to that given how slowly I'm progressing. <coughs> Well, this is almost done. So, so this means at the end of the day... Sorry, yes. Boy, so what is the conclusion? What you said, that you can drop the theta? So the conclusion is that at the end of the day, you can split this term, both the real and virtual term, into a contribution from angle smaller than r and a contribution from angle larger than r. The contribution from angle larger than r is a factor of 1 here, factor minus 1 there, so they cancel. If you wish to factor out, this gives you an exponential of plus the integration between r and, and whatever, and this gives you an exponential of minus the integration between r and infinity, and the product is 1. That's the mathematical way of proving it. Physically, it means that if you're not sensitive to an emission, like this one, real and virtual will cancel. That's, and, and actually, this is, this is very important whenever you do a recent calculation. The real and virtual, whenever you work in the soft and collinear limit, you know, it, it's a consequence of, of infrared and safety, if you wish. You know that divergences have to cancel, which means they have the same mathematical limit when angles and energy go to zero, which means that if you're not sensitive to something, the weight of the positive emission, of the real emission, is minus the weight of the vertical emissions, exactly, they have to cancel, otherwise they won't cancel in the pure soft and linear limit, in the limit where it goes to zero, and so that means that they, can, they cancel, globally speaking. So my question was, at the end of the day... Can so this means at the end of the day, I can limit my integration here up to theta smaller than r and same thing here. Right, but the theta function of the, of the constraint is more than m squared is still valid, right? And the theta function here is still valid. So it's not factorizing yet. No, no, no. So before, what I'm speaking is just this part. I belonging to jet. I belonging to jet means theta has to be smaller than r. And if yeah, theta is smaller, if theta is one, if I is not belonging to jet, right? And then it's cancelled the visual right. 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 Essentially, all the emissions which are outside the jet don't contribute here, don't contribute there. There's no theta function there, and so they cancel between real and virtual, and so I can drop them. Namely, I can just write down the upper bound of my theta integrations as uh, so theta squared is more than r squared because I've written everything in terms of of squared thing. All right, we're almost there. So, the next thing is, uh, how can I do this? Yeah, so another way of writing this down is just, uh, can I do, no, I cannot do it this way at this stage. Uh, so the next thing is simplifying this expression. And that's something, again, there's a simple way to do it. If you work in the double logarithm approximation, the leading log approximation, 
this is really something I want you to keep in mind because that's going to come over and over again in this kind of calculations. If you work in the leading log, you can assume that all emissions are factorized. That means they're strongly ordered. If you want, that means leading log, remember, leading log means each power of alpha s comes with two logs. So the minute you're going to take, I don't know, some zi of order zj or some theta i of order theta j or some zi theta i squared of order zj theta j squared, the minute you take something like that, you essentially constrain two emissions to be in the same part of the phase space, and so you lose one of these logs. Okay? So if you want something which counts, which has a maximum number of logs, you can assume that any pair of particles and any variable you take, one is much bigger or much smaller than the other. Watch out. It doesn't mean, for example, imagine you have two emissions. It doesn't mean that you have theta 1 much smaller than theta 2 and z1 much smaller than z2. It means that if you have theta 1 much smaller than theta 2, you have either z1 much smaller than z2 or z1 much bigger than z2. You can have the two different, different ordering. Right? I'm just saying they're ordered. I'm not saying they're nested. This is not, this is not exactly the same thing. So in particular, it means that in this case, let me define rho i, which is z i theta i squared. Uh, I want an air square somewhere. I've missed something. Uh, the pt squared we forgot there. Oh, yeah, I've got a pt squared. Let me put a far r squared there. Again, the idea is that angles are normalized by the radius. Uh, so that means if I build this set of variables for all the expressions, if two of these row i's are of the same order, I'm, going, I'm not going to have an alpha s to the n log to the n. So this means I can assume that the row variables are strongly ordered. That means if I take two of them, one is substantially is much smaller than the other and can be neglected compared to the other in this case. So this means in this case, the theta, let me do this on the side here, the theta of the sum over i z sum of the r i uh, this is rho i rho i smaller than rho I'm divided by p t squared r squared left and right that's the sum of rho i smaller than rho can you simplify that sum rho one minus rho so I'm essentially saying that the rows are strongly ordered in that case what's that sum here rho one uh, wait, wait, well the max this is just the max over i of rho i I'm not assuming one is much bigger than the others because, again, uh, that can sometimes be seen. So you have a sum where all, if you take any two objects in the sum, one is always much bigger than the other, the sum is just going to be the largest one of the set. And so this means that this theta function, if, the, if you want the max to be smaller than something, it means that each single element has to be smaller. So this means that you have log, uh, I'm too used to work with logs, I should have made it to zero, the sum for n from zero to infinity, one over n factorial integration d theta squared right, over i theta i squared up to r squared, theta i squared, the integration from zero to one dz i p of z i alpha s over two pi, and then you have a product over i theta z i theta i squared over r squared smaller than rho, and you'll have exactly the same thing for the vertical correction with a minus sign, so I can now write this down as minus one. And what does this give you? Uh, this is minus theta of z i theta i squared over r squared bigger than rho in this case. And so at the end of the day, this gives you sigma of rho is just the exponential of minus the integration between 0 and r squared squared, the integration between 0 and 1, dz 
Spiel dieselbe. Phi Theta of Living for the World I big enough. Now, should you also use automatically p of z equals 1 over z to be consistent? Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll get there in a minute. So let me first comment on this first, and then discuss p of z afterwards. Uh, do you recognize this expression? If you do that integration there, this is exactly the same integration that we had in the previous hour. This module the minus sign in front this is exactly the contribution for one emission to have a mass larger than rho. So this is exactly the same expression that led to that structure over there. So this is actually an amazing result. You should all be extremely thrilled now. What we've just derived is the fact that if you want to be able to compute all orders in QCD, which is something greedy. potentially extremely greedy, uh, at the end of the day, the result just takes the form of taking the alpha S expression in the soft and clear limit and taking the exponential. All right? Uh, so again, in this case, this integration is just going to give you that result. There's going to be a double log, which is the leading log, plus some contribution coming from hard and hard cranial splitting, which, is, which technically speaking is an ex-leading log. Uh, contribution, but okay, if you forget about the B term here, and that's what we're probably going to do for the next uh, next three lectures. Uh, essentially, what happens is that if you just have to compute the order of s and then potentially make some checks that things exponentially. Okay. Now a few. Maybe just to be sure. Uh, what about the exponentiation? When you have an exponential, you need a single power of one over n factorial. We have that power, single power, because you assume angular ordering. But you, know, you do not assume energy ordering, yes? Like, it's, one, it's one way or another. You, you do whatever you want. So, well, in the way you are so far, you assume angular ordering. No, no. I've just assumed that I only have primary emissions. I only have emissions from the quark. Then you, then you can decide whichever way you order them. No, but in this case, either you order. So, and, and that's essentially what I meant when I said, at the moment, imagine you have theta 1 much more than theta 2, or theta 2 much more than theta 1. You should be assuming your ordering, as you say. So if I assume your ordering, then I can have either z1 much bigger than z2, or z1 much smaller than z2. Mm -hmm. okay, yeah. If you do assume both uh, ordering in energy and angle, you then you have n factorial squared. But in that case, you have, well, physically speaking, you have, you have both. I mean, in a way, that's and why I tend to. That's why I prefer. Automatically, it goes from exponential to a Bessel if you if you assume them both. So I don't understand how. But uh, when we're n factorial squared, that would be the series exponent, the series uh, Bessel function. I understand, but that should be a limit of that, and I don't see it. Because if you can do both, you can do all, if you can do more, you can do also less, right? You can, if you can. No, no, no. You, you need to have an observable which is sensitive, which essentially drops one of these two terms. I see. Okay. Okay. There's a difference. Yes. Yeah. So uh, I'd like to make a few comments on this and then come back to my, uh, to my list of things. There's another one which is uh, so this is essentially the list of things I've, I've assumed so far. It's rho i bigger than rho, so z i yeah, is i squared bar. bigger than rho. It's a rho bar, right? The theta bar, rho bar. It's not, uh, there's no rho i anymore, right? Yes, then sir. There are no yeah, 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 sorry. No, yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Th this would be z theta squared over r squared right. bigger than rho. Okay. Okay. So, this thing is called the Sudakov exponent. Now, physically, what happens is that you have a list of. Uh, yeah, l let me actually introduce something. Uh, that's something I'm going to use graphically to. Uh, that's an important thing I'm going to use graphically all, all over the, the talk. Each emission 
can be represented as two variables. Some people like to use theta and z. There's actually a motivation. I'll come back to that again in a second. There's a motivation instead of using theta and z to use, so you don't want to use theta and z at the very least. You want to use log theta and log z because you want to probe emissions in, in logarithmic regions of the phase space. So I'm going to use an x-axis represent each emission at log 1 over theta or log r over theta in the, in the x-axis. And in the vertical axis, instead of using log 1 over z, what I'm going to do is use log of z theta. Uh, explanation in a second for this. Uh, so in this case, the limit, graphically speaking, the limit, there's, there's a kinematic limit here which corresponds to z equals 1. Again, I'll let you, this is uh, trivial, uh, it's literally linear manipulations of logs. Uh, you want z smaller than 1, that means you want this plus this to be smaller than something. Uh, so if you want a line where rho is constant, so remember rho is an, a line where z theta squared is constant, is essentially going to be a line like this. So you have somewhere here a line z theta squared over r squared equals rho. And you can represent each emission by a dot in this way. I essentially, that, that, that's this expression here, right? I'm essentially assuming that all the emissions live somewhere in that, in that space independently. They're, they're all independent of one another. Uh, now, essentially, if you forget about the splitting here and just say the splitting is 1 over z, what this means is that the density of points in that plane is uniform. It's like shooting da dots at random in this place and then summing over any number of emissions you can have here. All right? Now, the way to interpret this, you say I want a mass, a jet mass, which is smaller than this line here. Okay? What does this do? It means that I essentially I cannot have any emissions in this region. If I have any real emission in this region, it's going to contribute to this, to this sum, so it's going to contribute to the mass of the jet and put it above the upper cut I've put. So if you want the mass to be smaller than rho, which is exactly this quantity, I'm vetoing, what you really do in physically is vetoing any emission in this region up there. So if you veto any emission up there, all the emissions which are down are allowed. If you have an emission here which is allowed, real emissions are allowed, you'll have a corresponding virtual emission at the same, at exactly the same point which is allowed as well, and so real and virtual corrections do cancel in that region. Now, if you look in the region up here, real emissions are forbidden. Virtual emissions are still allowed. So at the end of the day, the probability that you don't have, a, that your mass is smaller than m squared or rho is smaller than, than the product rho, means that you need to, you have a perfect cancellation below, and you just have virtual corrections above. And virtual corrections just contribute to minus the real emissions in that region. And since they're independent, you'd expect an exponential. It's a very trivial way of seeing this. You have a region where you just have virtual emissions. Virtual correct emissions are just the minus sign of the real emissions, and we know they exponentiate. It's just that I'm only considering those virtual emissions which are above the curtain placing. So physically speaking, this is really, this is re really the one thing you should remember. At the end of the day, what, what you're generally doing when you're making something like that is putting a cut where you're vetoing real emissions in the part of the phase space and you just have real, sorry, you're vetoing real emissions in the part of the phase space, you're left with, ex, you're left with virtual emissions which do exponentiate. Okay? Uh, yeah, something like 30 ish minutes, let's put it that way. Uh, what do I want to do now? All right, so is there any question about this? Let me make sure I have a bullet list of points I need to make. Uh, so the same thing worked for thrust and, and, the, Cam and the Cambridge uh, or KT clustering we, we did last week. Just take the logs and exponentiate them and you get a resummation. Uh, good. Okay, that's fine. So uh, now we need to go through uh, 
So this derivation, strictly speaking, is valid at leading rock. We've done everything completely kosher, assuming things are strongly ordered, soft and collinear. That's it. Approximation in the observable, assuming emissions factorize, uh, assuming there's a strong order in here, and then if you want the strictly speaking double log, you need the P of Z to be two color factors of a Z. There's one thing I didn't mention, and that's, uh, let me do it now because otherwise I will forget. It's one of the things I didn't put on my list there, which is this question mark here. Uh, you know in QCD the coupling is not fixed, right? Uh, what's the argument of alpha x? And so imagine I do have an emission here with a certain angle theta and a certain fraction z. The, uh, the argument of the coupling, the typical argument of the coupling is the momentum of the transverse momentum of this emission relative to its observer. That's again an old result in QCD. And so this is a KT, that's the transverse momentum of the emission. This is KT, which is z times theta times PT, again the limit where things are soft. So the coupling I want to put here is z i theta i PT. And again, this carries through all the way down to here. Now, you're going to say I don't care because alpha s, you can write alpha s of z theta pt as alpha s of ptr divided by 1 plus 2 alpha s at the same scale beta 0 times log of z theta over r. That's one loop. That's the one loop running coupling. I'm just using a uh, result known since 50 years now. Uh, and again, I don't care. I want each power of alpha s to come with two powers of the log, so this is only a single log I can neglect it. Uh, this is mostly a question of conventions. The, there's a way to organize the perturbative series expansion in a way that actually this is considered leading log. Okay? So typically speaking, people do include rain coupling as part of the, double, as part of the leading log. On top of that, it's trivial, right? What you only have to do is just well, this calculation there is a bit more complicated because you now have some extra factors in it, but it's not. That's a calculation that's done in. Uh, I mean, I could technically do it in the bottom of the in the bottom part of the, of the blackboard there. So it's really an easy calculation. So now shopping list. Uh, where do I start? Okay, this one. Leading log, no problem. No problems at all at leading log. You can assume you want two logs. We've derived it that way, right? You can assume strong ordering, particular strong ordering in rows. And so this means that this is exact at leading log. Now, if you, if you go to next to leading log, you can start having a region where the rows are, no, so essentially when you go to the next reading log, you should start relaxing at least one of your conditions. At least one of your strong ordering needs to be relaxed. So you can go into a region where uh, more than one particle starts to contribute to rho. And in this case, that means that you can no longer simplify this. Yeah, just to be sure, when you go to the next reading log, in particular, you also take into account the finite part of the speaking function, right? So this term here is part of the next leading log. Exactly. Again, I don't want to spend too much time on that because the, the, the part that you, re you already have the part that you need for the rest of the lectures, which is this. I'm sometimes going to include this because I, th there's a reason again, but that's, uh, I'm sometimes going to include this again, but that's cheap. Once you can calculate this, you get this for free almost. It's just the finite part of the spinning function. Uh, the rest of that list here, I want to, con I, Right, that part is cheaper in the, in the speaking, in the, but you have also the, the change in the, in the kinematic cutoff which go together, that that's what looks to me not trivial. The change in the kinematic cutoff? The fact that you cannot factorize the theta function, where you, you were just saying that, the one row i two are comparable with each other. No, no, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. What I wanted to know is go through the list, the com hopefully the complete, list of things you need to consider if you want, to, if you were to go to next reading log, okay? So one is this. Right. We've already done it, so 
kind of stuff. That not the one that Another one is the fact that you've, and if you do one, you don't do the other. Because if you do this one, you've already lost the log in a way. So if you've already lost the log, you don't care about losing okay, log somewhere else. Okay, 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 okay. That, now I understand. Yeah, so, and that, that's, that's again, if you, if you want to make systematic improvement in going to further improving the precision of your recent calculation, the rule of thumb is once you lose a log somewhere, you're allowed to make stronger assumptions somewhere else. And this is the case. If, you, if you're assuming that you have a hard linear splitting, then you don't care. Now, if you want to go to the next, next reading log, you'll have a situation when you have one log like this and one log like that. Uh, now, if the rows are the same, you can actually, uh, you can no longer do this. And physically speaking, this contributes, this is the case where instead of having, so I, I told you the assumption you're making at leading log is all the dots are well separated in that in that phase space. So if one is here and gives you, the, imagine you want to measure differential distribution, now it's a cumulative distribution, tells you I need V total emissions above there, and I need one emission somewhere on that line, and that emission somewhere on that line is going to give you my jet mass. So a, a way to write this down is say I'm going to define R as the area of that triangle. And so you know you have an e to the minus r vetoing emissions in that, in that region. And if you want the, the cross section, so that would be sigma of rho. And if you want the cross section over sigma d sigma d rho, that is going to be the, the line here. But the line here is just essentially the derivative of that triangle with respect, to, with respect to rho. You can get the length here by taking the derivative of the area varying rho. So this is r prime e to the minus r. Now, this fails if you say, now I'm going to have rows which can be of the same order, because now I can have two emissions somewhere here, and they can be slightly below the line so that the sun goes exactly under the line. Uh, globally speaking, this is complicated. What you have to do is deal with the full expression here and find a way to handle these two orders. There's actually one case which simplifies drastically which says if your observable is additive, meaning your observable can be written as the sum over each individual contribution, and yippee, that's the case of the mass. The mass is just the sum of all the contribution from each particle. Rho is the sum of the rho i's. Uh, in this case, uh, it's actually a calculation which, okay, it's what it is. You go to mailing space, you massage your expressions, you go back from mailing space, and what you find is that if your observable is additive, this expression, is sigma of rho, is e to the minus r, minus gamma e r prime divided by gamma of 1 plus r prime. OK, that's what it is. Uh, so bottom line, at next reading order, you need to take this into account. And all the observables I'm going to consider in these lectures are either of the additive form, so this holds. Or uh, you can define a simpler example. Instead of saying I have my observable, which is the sum of each contribution, which would be additive, I can say the observable is the max of all these, of these Vs. If the observable is the max, then you're done, because the max is exactly the assumption we've made. So if you take the observable as the max, uh, you just go back to the leading log. There's no effect like this. Okay? But OK, that's, that's an aside. Apart from these two cases, uh, the rest is usually more complicated. Unless you can break it down into some of things like that, but that's, uh, uh, that's beyond what I want to say. So, this is done. Uh, next one, QED. If you want to go beyond QED, you'll start to have to deal with cases like this. What do you do with this? Well, you start looking. So, I want here an emission with a z much smaller than 1, and then this blue one splits. Okay, there's several cases. Either it splits at small angle. Uh, if it splits at small angle, you don't care because uh, given the clustering algorithm, these two are going to, rec to be recombined with one another. And then practically speaking, the jet you're going to see is exactly as if something like that was happening. And if you s uh, there's going to be a real emission, a real collinear emission like that, a virtual collinear emission like this one, and essentially the real and virtual cancel each other, and so this doesn't matter. So not only the real, the, the double, there's, there's no double log in here because the soft and collinear is going to cancel. There's no collinear log because the collinear is going to cancel as well. 
uh, hold on to that thought for one. I'm going to going back to this later. Uh, now there can be a soft emission. There can be an emission here, which is somewhere with an angle which is not necessarily small, so non-collinear, but with a z, say z, say this is z1, with z1 times z2, with z2 much smaller than 1. Well, what happened to this? Imagine this emission is caught somewhere in your jet. It's not exactly cancelling between one and the other, but the correction to the jet mass due to this, this z, this emission here is going to add the contribution to your jet mass, which is z1, z2 times some angle. And since z2 is much smaller than 1, this is much smaller than the jet mass you would have from just this emission alone. Okay? So in the limit where z2 goes to 0, the jet mass between this real emission and this virtual emission is exactly the same, and so they cancel each other again. You can essentially neglect this contribution from the jet mass. So double soft and, soft and collinear don't count, collinear don't count, soft don't count. You're just left with hard and collinear, but hard and collinear, uh, hard and non collinear, uh, finite alpha is corrections, you lose two logs, so not next to being log. So in the first approximation, QED results and QCD results are the same. There's one difference. The fact that this emission can actually, this emission plus that emission, is actually giving, in the collinear limit, is actually giving a correction to alpha s. So you can, uh, if you want to go to the next reading log, there's an extra correction I haven't mentioned, which is instead of taking the one loop expansion here, you take a two loop beta function. And if you take the two loop beta function, this, the sum of these two in the collinear limit, brings a similar correction. And you can view this either by saying I'm resumming them, or by saying I'm absorbing this correction. This is collinear, so this is local if you wish. This particle doesn't care about collinear emissions the there. No, what I'm doing here is assuming this emission here is collinear. Okay, so and so this real. plus this actually does bring a correction which you can reabsorb into the running coupling. And so instead of having this, you'll get a term here which is beta 1. Next one called. And you'll have an extra term which is known as k times something. And this is known, it's essentially equivalent to changing the renormalization scheme. And this is going from MS bar to the CMW. So it's, it's, it's equivalent, it's just equivalent to changing the way, changing your renormalization scheme. And again, but it doesn't change this expression. This exponential remains valid, it's just that you need an extra term in the exponential. And it's Ciappelloni, Marquezini, and Weber for CMW who came up with this ages ago. Uh, all right. So this done. Going from QCD to QED, QED to QCD is, is easy. R much smaller than 1. Ah, that's becoming more, uh, more complicated. So what happens if you want to go beyond r, beyond small r? What else can happen? You can have a case where you just have a single log by saying my emission here is at any angle and z much smaller than 1. All right? So this would give you an alpha s times log times finite. So Typically speaking, this is the kind of thing you need to, you need to include. Um, how do you do this? Uh, it's, that's essentially a one-page calculation. Uh, I won't bother you with a one-page calculation when everyone is starving. I, I told you, my main motto is discussing physics rather than going to lengthy calculations. This is mostly the only technical calculation I'm going to do. The rest is recycling this. Uh, so. Soft and collinear. Remember, who remembers that we spoke about soft and non collinear last week? Uh, remember, E plus E minus going to QQ bar gluon? I told you there are two limits that are interesting. One is collinear, in which case you factorize the splitting function. One is soft, in which case you do E plus E minus, and you actually consider your E plus E minus as a dipole which radiates a soft gluon. And that comes with a factor, if this is k1, k2, and k3, that comes with a factor which is k1 dot alpha s proportional to alpha s. Well, you get an integration. You get a contribution, which is an integration d4k3 times k1 dot k2, that's alpha s, over k1 dot k3, k3 dot k2. 
And again, if you think about it in terms of energies, this is going to have, uh, th there's a delta of k3 squared. Uh, this gives you, an, uh, if you take an energy omega to omega, and gives us a 1 over k3 squared, which is divided by omega squared. So this is the omega over omega. So you, you'll get your soft logs coming from, coming from this expression. You get soft logs, but you get the full angular structure by taking this full kinematics here into account. So in this case, what you'll do, you, can, you can do that calculation. Now you keep your expression everywhere. You keep these four vectors exact. And at the end of the day, what you get is something which does reproduce this term here. Again, soft and collinear is present in both approaches. The collinear limit this time goes to zero, so you also have some d theta or d over theta in this context. But you get extra terms. Uh, these extra terms have to be zero in the limit where the angle goes to zero. If, you, if I take the limit r going to 1, I need to recover this, this results here. So at least what you get if you do this is the double log result plus some terms which are going to be of order r squared times log 1 over say sigma. Let me sigma 1 for the. Uh, It's, I mean, the, the, product, the product k1 dot k2, right, which vanishes when the, when the angle is 0. k1 dot k2 is No, k1 dot k3. It's, it's division 3, which can be either collinear here. Uh, so I'm looking at the jet here. k3 can become collinear here. And that's going to give you a double log. No, but the air now is the angle between k1 and k2, the air. No, no, I, I'm generally taking r, which is, which is somewhere here. I'm taking a jet around this guy. And looking at the mass of a jet around this guy, okay. Now, if the radius is big enough, you can have emissions which are somewhere close to the edge. And in this case, this expression, is, well, think about it that way. This expression would start as something 1 minus cosine theta. And 1 minus cosine theta is not just theta, it's, it's not just theta squared. It's theta squared plus higher order corrections. And you'll get corrections like this all over the place. At the end of the day, the expression involves uh, polydox and, so, and such. So, uh, so yeah. By the way, this is the same as the BF kernel. Yeah, I was thinking, but in the BF kernel, the, the vanishing is with a dipole side, which will be like here the angle between K one and K two. That's the parent. No, no, no. But in that case, that's the vanishing. If you take K three collinear, the vanishing is between K one, K two, and K two, K three. So this one can and this one gives you one over theta. Yeah, that's the double. Yeah, that's the double. Uh, all right, so uh, actually this is, you can show that this exponentiates as well. This is great. Uh, this is one, what I want you to feel is that this is more complicated. I mean, this calculation I could do. This calculation then involves some dialogues already in this simple d plus e minus case. Uh, it's already something which is a bit more meaty, uh, more complicated, more complex. Uh, now, at the end of the day, you don't want to be just doing e plus e minus to q q bar glue on or e plus e minus things. If you want to do that to pp, at the end of the day, imagine you have a situation, you have quark glue on or quark anti-quark going to two jets, and you want to measure the mass of this jet here with a soft and large angle glue on here. Actually, this glue on can be emitted from any two pair, any dipole you can make out of, of these four legs. So you'll have a sum over all possible pairs you can have here, and the sum of all possible pairs each have a kinematic factor which depends on the intricate kinematics here. It depends on the rapidity of these two jets. It depends on the momentum of the incoming quarks and gluons. It depends in a crazy way of, on the current factors of this. So the bottom line is that each dipole here, well, the, the main, most complicated thing here is that in this case, this dipole comes to the factor of CF. In a generic case, if you have a line i and line j, this comes with a color factor which depends on the, on the product of representations of particles i and j. And so this is a color matrix. Uh, if you have three particles, you can use color conservation to write the product of two as a linear combination of the others. So if you have three par two particles, it's just cf squared, cr squared. Three particles, you can write this down as a combination of, C, uh, of Casimir's. Starting from four particles and upwards, uh, this is a matrix, and you have to treat this as a matrix, which depends horrendously on all the uh, kinematics of the hot process. 
it still does exponentiate. That's the bright light at the end of the tunnel, but the exponential is the exponential of the matrix, which is not easy to calculate. All right? So uh, the main thing, the main physical idea is that there's generally a factorization if you go in the collinear limit. If you go in the collinear limit, what happens here doesn't depend on the rest of the event. If you go in the soft limit, the whole event matters. So collinear are simple, soft, more delicate. Okay? Doable, but more delicate. Uh, so from now on, I'm sticking with the, well, from next week onwards, I'm going to stick with our, it's much more and more. So uh, this is that. And these two I can do in a single, uh, well, these two. Uh, let me start with emissions out. Emissions out. I told you emissions out didn't matter. And they don't in the colonial limits, because again, if I have an emission outside in the colonial limit, whatever happens outside remains outside, and I don't care. Now, if you go in the soft limit, you can have, so imagine one particle flying around here, that's your jet, and you want an emission, you, what you can have is an emission outside with z1 much more than 1, emitting an emission soft and large angle back inside your jet with z2 much smaller than z1. So this is our phi s times a soft log. Our phi s times a soft log, you get an alpha square log square, which is the same order as, as, as what we've considered so far. Uh, that's something which is called non-global algorithms. Uh, that calculation to order alpha square you can do. Again, it's somewhere, uh, I can give you references, it's a page long calculation. Uh, that calculation's resum to all orders is basically unknown. Uh, you can know it, so the, the easiest thing to do in that case is go to the large NC limit, because in the large NC limits everything is dipoles and you can write the things down as dipole fairly easily. And even in that case, if you do the large NC limit, you still probably want to handle, imagine you have a million emissions like this, with uh, any number of emissions here, emitting an emission, emitting itself an emission, emitting itself an emission, and finally that last one emits something in there. And each of those have to be treated with that antenna formula I was just showing, with horrendous kinematics at the end of the day. So even in this case, what people usually do, in a large NC, you can factorize things in a fairly reasonable way, but still, at the end of the day, you want to use some form of numerical integration of all these things. Uh, there's been recently developments to get this uh, beyond large NC. Eribert did something like that, and Yoshi did something like that in that context. So non-global logs, mm, delicate beast. Actually, once you have non-global logs, this falls in the same category, right? Uh, if you have just one emission, whether it belongs to the jet or not, is whether it's within R. That's by definition of the jet algorithm. Now, if you start having two emissions, again, if you start having two emissions at the edge of your jet, either something like that or something like this, Depending on the clustering algorithm you use, you may merge these two with this particle being outside, or you may merge these two with this particle being inside. So the clustering is going to affect which particle is in and out. And that, again, is some f it's, it's equivalent to a non global box. It's the same form as a non global algorithm. So it's an alpha square log square in this context. Uh, for NTKT, you like it, doesn't matter. Because NTKT is just going to draw a circle, and in this case, essentially, you don't care about whatever happening besides the non global log. So, this is just, you can replace each emission if is in, a, in or out depending on R, just depending on R, and so you just get the standard form of non global logs without, uh, without any complication. So, again, if you want to do that calculation for KT or Cambridge, this is doable. So, I'm going to conclude by giving you references that I promised. Uh, so, the take home message. Uh, let me make sure I didn't forget anything. Uh, no, that's fine. Here's the end. Take a message. Remember this. And that goes over there. Leading logs just throw points randomly in this in this plane uh, because of the running of the coupling. The density is not quite homogeneous. It runs when you go down. Uh, but you calculate one emission. It exponentiates at double log. If you want to go beyond. 
uh, there's a shopping list of things you need to worry about. Non-global logs, soft emissions, uh, finite R corrections, uh, clustering logs. Now, references. For what I said, I don't have the archive numbers, unfortunately. For what I said last week, there's uh, most of it is genuine textbook. Uh, there's a book called QCD and Collider Physics. The Ping Book, which is uh, Ellis Sterling and Weber. That's a genuine basic book. I mean, everyone should have that on, the, on their bookshelves. Uh, for all the things related to, so that, that's essentially introduction to thrust and all these things that's in there, soft and going our emissions. Uh, for everything which is related to uh, jet definitions, there's mm, something called towards uh, jetography. Uh, that's essentially Gavin Salam's uh, habilitation thesis 10 years ago. It's a bit outdated in the sense it, ha it contains all the discussions about infrared green our safe definition of jet, which was a hot topic 10 years ago, and, uh, and that's it. Uh, for all the rest, uh, there's something called looking, what I'm trying to follow from now on, is something called looking inside jets. And it's actually some Springer lecture notes that we wrote uh, together with Simone Marzani and Mike Spanowski. Uh, last year. What I did today in terms of the jet mass is chapter three, I think, three or four. It's chapter four of the book. Uh, what I did last week is actually covered by chapter three of the book. You have the archive numbers on the time. The yeah, archive number is somewhere, yeah, yeah. I mean, but mm, these titles are, I mean, if you type towards photography, you'll find it, and looking inside jet, you'll find it as well. Uh, so, next week, so now we have whatever we want. We know what jets are, we know that there's some all the structure underlying this whole thing. Next week, we're going to discuss real jet substructure and do some physics with it. Okay, so this was the technical part, next week is the fun part. Thanks. I Maybe forgot there to are ask questions. Maybe there are questions. I forgot to ask if there were questions. Yeah. There are questions? I see, I went a bit over time. But what are we starting? Okay, no questions. Good. If, uh,